Greetings, everybody, and welcome to case study number 45. This will be a teenager with shock. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. Okay, so we have a 16-year-old white girl presenting to the ED with her mother complaining of fever and vomiting for the last four hours. She was her normal self until this afternoon after she got home from school when she quickly deteriorated. Her mom found her drowsy on the couch, sweating. The patient is drowsy but able to provide some history. She says that she's never had anything like this before. She hasn't encountered any sick contacts. Her last period was four days ago. They're regular. She's not sexually active. And she doesn't take contraception. She is on no medications. And let's take a look at her vitals. Knowing that later teenagers are pretty close to adults with vital signs. What stands out? She is severely hypotensive. At 77 over 41, naturally she's tachycardic. And she's got a fever. What does this make you think of? Shock. Particularly the possibility of septic shock. Okay. So this is not a stable patient. For our physical exam, we are going to be very, very quick. So general appearance, drowsy and communicative. Skin. She's got a rash. A diffuse erythematous rash on her trunk and arms. There are no wheels. That's something you want to look out for because anaphylactic shock is a possibility. Chest, lungs, heart, abdomen, all fine. Important now to do a genital exam. Why is it important to do a genital exam? Because one of the causes of shock is toxic shock syndrome. And one of the causes of toxic shock syndrome is retained tampons. So we got to do a genital exam. What we find is that there's some menstrual flow. That's okay. She's recently had her period. Vaginal hyperemia and a foul-smelling tampon retrieved from the vaginal vault. Okay, so that exam should go fairly quickly. However... And I want to get into this right now before we go through our differential. You need to be very fast with this. Um, now, on CCS, if you go ahead and order IV normal saline bolus before you do your physical exam, that is okay. Because we're going to be doing this anyway. And so, you know, typically in real life, this is something that nurse will tell you, uh, this patient's coming in, she's 75 over 45. Yeah, you're getting that bolus right away, even before you see her. Um, but uh, it is also fine on CCS to go ahead and do your physical exam. Just be fast. Do not do a full physical exam. You got to be pretty quick about this stuff. So our differential, we're thinking things that cause septic shock and toxic shock. So... Meningococcemia, certainly possible, very common cause of septic shock. Toxic shock syndrome, as mentioned, gram-negative sepsis, typhoid fever, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Both of those will give you um, a rash. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to do those emergent orders. We want to give IV normal saline, supplemental oxygen, and remove the tampon. Uh, we're going to get a CBC, BMP, uh, and then... Anytime you've got a patient who is septic appearing, you want to get cultures. That's a urine culture and blood culture. And because we're thinking of the possibility of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you can get rickettsia antibodies. Highly unlikely it's going to come back, but um, that is something that you can do. So we did the IV normal saline, blood pressure increases to 102 over 74, and the patient's more alert. CBC with differential. We've got an elevated white count, hemoglobin is fine, we have a thrombocytopenia, and predominant neutrophils and left shift. BMP. The BUN and creatinine are both elevated, the ratio is over 20, so we know we're dealing with a pre-renal process going on here. Not uncommon when you've got hypovolemia. Urinalysis and uh, blood culture are pending. The urinalysis was unremarkable. The culture is pending. 
So our diagnosis here presumptively is toxic shock syndrome. This is a clinical diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis, and we'll see what some of the uh, criteria are. The management is going to be empiric antibiotics. You do not want to wait. You're not going to wait for blood cultures. You're not going to wait for urine cultures. You are going to start antibiotics right away. you got a patient with shock. She's got features of toxic shock syndrome. You're going to go ahead and start antibiotics. You may or may not use steroids. Um, there's evidence saying, you know, going both ways. So I included it here, uh, but that's that's uh, your call. And then she's got to be on maintenance fluids. We got to admit her to the ICU for observation. Toxic shock syndrome carries a significant mortality rate, so we need to observe. And then, of course, your general ICU orders, we want to do DVT prophylaxis. Fortunately, on uh, step three, that will be an order you can put in on CCS. Um, we're talking things here like heparin or low molecular weight heparin, compression stockings, pneumatic compression devices. Um, then omeprazole because of the possibility of a stress ulcer and monitor isonos. And then the urine and blood culture came back negative. Now, why would it be negative in toxic shock syndrome? Because we're not actually dealing with bacteria in the blood. We're dealing with a toxin, an exotoxin that's causing all these problems. It's causing a cytokine storm. And so um, it's not a matter of bacteria in the blood. It's a matter of toxin in the blood. And so naturally, you're not going to grow anything. That's not all the time, though. Sometimes you might grow staff or, uh, you know, but it's, it's um, usually it's just due to the toxin. There's no bacteria in the blood. Uh, all right. So toxic shock syndrome is an acute toxin mediated illness characterized by fever, hypotension, an erythematous rash, and multi-organ dysfunction. It's most commonly associated with staph aureus, which is the cause of the classic toxic shock syndrome. That toxin is TSST1, and then streptococcus pyogenes, uh, that is a, a streptococcal um, toxin, um, it's, it's a uh, pyrotoxin, um, so that's not as important, but either can, can cause this. The symptoms early on are flu-like, and it'll quickly progress to the rash, the sepsis, or the shock, and, uh, and altered mental status. The rash looks like a sunburn. I got some pictures. I'll show you in a little bit. It can involve the mucous membrane, so you can get hyperemia of the mouth, of the vagina, and eventually this rash will desquamate. The diagnosis is clinical. There's no specific test. The treatment you got to resuscitate the patient and start empiric antibiotics. What antibiotics? Always, 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 at least on CCS, go for clindamycin. Why clindamycin? Because it decreases toxin production. Okay, that is super important. We're not talking in toxic shock syndrome, we're not talking about bacteria in the blood, we're talking about toxin. We want to reduce toxin production. So clindamycin does that. And then we'll add vancomycin, but there are other drugs that you can add. That's for MRSA coverage, because typically this is strep, or I'm sorry, typically this is staph, staph aureus. So remember, some pointers, do not delay antibiotics while waiting for cultures. You can use vasopressors if fluids do not uh, bring the blood pressure back up to normal, um, and then you want to debride any infected wound. This is what the rash looks like. It kind of looks like a sunburn. These are your criteria. So if you have, there are five criteria. If you have four, then it's presumptive. And if you have five, it's confirmed. But do not wait to have five before you treat, okay? This is, these are just your clinical um, criteria here. So what did we have in this patient? We had the temperature, we had the rash, we didn't have desquamation, but remember that's one to two weeks after onset, so we're not gonna see that. We had the hypotension, and then the multi-system involvement. Well, GI, she had vomiting, um, mucous membrane, she had the vaginal hyperemia, she had the uh, elevated BUN and creatinine, so right there she's got three. So she's got four out of five criteria.
and therefore she's got a presumptive toxic shock. But we are not waiting to start antibiotics. Common differentials, acute meningococcemia can show up with shock. These patients will tend to have more of a prominent headache, neck ache, and meningeal signs. At that point, you're going to go ahead and get a lumbar puncture, uh, plus or minus a CT, depending on uh, if, whether there's focal signs. CSF will show evidence of meningitis when you don't even need to get a culture. You can just look at the cytology. The blood culture will ultimately grow Neisseria meningitis. Gram-negative sepsis has similar presenting features, but you're not going to see the rash. Typically, the blood culture will be positive. Typhoid fever, look for history. Rose spots can be confused with the rash you see in toxic shock, but typhoid fever is just not common in the U.S. Uh, the blood culture will grow salmonella. Rocky Mountain spotted fever does have a fever and a similar rash, but they'll have the positive titers. Again, not super, super common. So to recap, toxic shock syndrome is an acute toxin-mediated illness characterized by fever, hypotension, erythroderma, or that sunburn-like rash, and multi-organ dysfunction. It's a clinical diagnosis, so keep a high index of suspicion, get an expedient workup, resuscitate the patient, and then get your blood cultures and start antibiotics. Clindamycin is a preferred agent because it stops toxin formation. You want to administer this with vancomycin to cover MRSA, but there are other drugs that cover MRSA, and you can certainly use those too. Just remember, we want to stop toxin formation and cover MRSA. These patients should be admitted to the ICU due to the high rate of complications. One of them, about half of patients, will develop acute respiratory distress syndrome, so you want to keep an eye out for that. Uh, DIC and end organ damage are also possibilities, so we want to follow these patients.